Welcome to Nailing the Apex, everyone. I'm Tim Haraney. Please head over to Spotify. Give us a five-star rating and a follow. Same goes with Apple Podcasts as well. You can also watch us on YouTube, and you can follow me on social media at Tim Haraney. Lewis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc have both been disqualified from the U.S. Grand Prix. Now, it's been an interesting four or five hours I would say taping this at uh, 9.45 p.m. local time. um, Race ended around 3.30-ish. And we didn't get a result until maybe three hours after that. So there you have it. It's been uh, been a long day. Um, Where do we start with this one with Hamilton and Leclerc? I mean... One of the biggest issues is obviously this being a sprint race weekend. And having a sprint race weekend means that you don't get all your free practice sessions. You only get one free practice session. Where normally these teams, you know, they get three within a weekend. Free practice one, free practice two on Friday, and free practice three on the Saturday. Now, teams really use those practice sessions to learn the car, optimize it, and try and get a better understanding of setup windows. But also what they do is they work with ride heights. And the lower you run these race cars to the ground, the faster they're going to go, the more performance you're uh, going to get. But if you go back to 2022, when we had porpoising issues and the FIA came in and mandated that teams could only run the cars so high off the ground. And so skid blocks are put onto the cars to uh, police just how much these cars are uh, uh, grinding along the pavement, bouncing, running over the curbs. Um, and just essentially it's a legal issue as well at the same time. So I think at the end of the day, when you go back to 2022 and, you know, Mercedes opened that can of worms with, uh, porpoising and not being able to get that under control at their car, where a lot of the other teams were able to get that. Uh, under control with their car. And then you fast forward all the way to uh, today, the U.S. Grand Prix, and you know, lo and behold, the car was run too low to the ground, and that wore out the skid, skid blanks, and they were chosen to um, have uh, underneath their car and the skid planks measured to see if that was the case, and sure enough, it was. They were worn down too much. So, uh, two was Charles Leclerc's Ferrari and both of them get disqualified. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into all of that. I mean, I, uh, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, all these cars, they, they all bought them out. They all run across, you know, the, the, the ground. Um, that's why we see the sparking and, you know, I, they all do it. We're we're talking about, you know, millimeters and inches here. And so, you know, I think at the end of the day, it, it revolves a lot around this sprint race weekend and why I'd mentioned, you know, they only get one free practice session to um, optimize the car. You know, I was uh, speaking with, you know, Mike Crack uh, earlier on a Sunday evening. And, you know, that was one of the things that he had brought up. It's just not enough track time um, for the teams during this sprint race weekend. Uh, essentially, some of the times they're rolling the dice on some of these things with ride heights and setup windows, and they don't really have as much time as they uh, require to you know, get that get that perfect setup, which on one hand, it can offer exciting racing, but on the other hand, uh, it can lead to issues like this, what we saw on, on Sunday with uh, Hamilton and Leclerc um, being disqualified from the race. And so I think one of the things the teams are definitely going to have to do is talk to F1, talk to the FIA. There, there has to be some sort of an agreement reached that if these sprint races are going to keep moving forward in the future, um, the teams may require uh, more time to, to set the cars up. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you look at Mercedes, they brought a brand new upgrade to the car, it was a brand new floor. It looked like it was working. Mercedes actually looked like uh, they were they were very competitive. They were, you know, battling Red Bull, even though Max did have a bit of a 
brake balance issue. Um, he had said that he was having trouble feeling the brake, but at the end of the day, you know, Mercedes was extremely competitive and you know, that, that bodes well for, for 2024 for sure, because it looks like they've really hit on something with this floor, but at the same time, not having that free practice two, free practice three, they're not getting the right optimization windows with high fuel loads, low fuel loads, different suspension changes, different suspension setups. Um, and you know, that's really, what led to uh, to them being disqualified, and same goes for for Ferrari. Just not enough time to uh, really optimize and find that that window where you know they're going to have performance, and the plank isn't going to get going to get worn away. And you know that essentially takes time and data to sift through and to look at and to see where. Because remember, though, these cars enter park for May, um, you know, Friday following uh, the qualifying. So you don't there's not a lot of time there and that's gonna that that has started to become an issue um this weekend i heard a lot of the teams complaining about it uh and they're complaining about the sprint race weekends um you know some of the teams not really uh enjoying the whole uh sprint race weekend i mean max verstappen being very vocal about uh sprint races and um on saturday he had said following his sprint race victory he thought that they were, he thought that they just weren't great for formula one because they're kind of ruining that build up, that anticipation of the big race on the Sunday. And, you know, I tend to agree with them. I've, I've never been a huge fan of the sprint races, but I appreciate the fact that, you know, F1 is trying different things. And I think that is positive. Um, and I think they, they definitely should keep trying uh, different things and, and seeing, uh, what works, what's entertaining, uh, and you know, what's good for formula one and, uh, the spectacle as well. Um, I think at the, the end of the day, the sprint races, I think they need to really mean something like they, they did in the past, you know, now we have these sprint shoot like Saturday is just all like sprint stuff. So you have your SQ one SQ, you know, your sprint qualifying, your sprint shootout, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, enjoy that. I don't, um, and I don't, and that leads to not really enjoying the sprint race only because, uh, there's not a lot on the line, right? Like if, if you go back to last year and years prior, you know, it meant something. It was setting the grid for the race. You still got the points, but it was setting the grid. And yes, I understand, you know, you're not getting um, like a real pole position, but, you know, it still built up that anticipation for the the big race. Um, and I think, you know, that's what it's all about. I still think you know, Sundays are so important. and. You know, those Sundays, they need to be held up on that pedestal. You need to, you need to ramp everything up towards that, in my opinion. So I think like moving forward, it, it'll be interesting to see like what ends up happening. I mean, obviously this is all new for, for this year with the, with the sprint day, like the Saturday sprint day. Um, but at the end of the day, kind of costed us you know a mercedes p2 and a and a charles leclerc finish as well i mean both of them are booted out of the race so i mean granted it moves logan Sargent into the points and that's good because he scored his first point in formula one with those two being disqualified and he did it on uh american soil and he did it as home race in america so well not his home race because miami would be his home race but you know what i mean um, it's awesome. You know, big congrats to Logan. Uh, that's huge. And, uh, he drove really well this weekend. You know, Logan, uh, had a hell of a race all weekend long and, uh, yeah, definitely, uh, happy for that guy he deserves it. And he's been working extremely hard. Uh, so yeah, super cool, um, for Logan to, to come away at those points and, uh, you know, Hey, builds the confidence. Let's we'll see what happens once Mexico rolls around and, uh, we get to Brazil and then, you know, we got Vegas, Abu Dhabi, and we'll, we'll see, see what shakes out from all this. But, um, you know, going back to the, the, uh, the disqualifications and, 
uh, you know, Mercedes and, uh, you know, the floor. I just, you know, want to go into that a little bit more. And, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll record another podcast later this week and, and dig into a lot of the other stuff that I had learned uh, throughout the weekend. Um, but, you know, looking at what Mercedes brought, I mean, it's pretty, it's a positive sign. And you know what? I, you know, uh, following Lewis around this weekend, being in on the press conferences, hearing him talk, body language. He looks happy, man. Like he really looks rejuvenated. That it like he looks very motivated. And I think that that's a positive sign. That's that tells me that, you know, whatever Mercedes is working on is working. And that is a is a good sign for next season. And it's a sign that says that, you know, we're not going to get, you know, complete Red Bull runaways. We're actually going to get, you know, some fighting at the front. And I, you know, I, I look at this Mercedes and, you know, it's a, it's a Frankenstein car. And, you know, it is. And, you know, where they started at the beginning of this season and, they transition aerodynamically the whole philosophy and changing that structure, you know, in Monaco and then carrying on and adding bits and pieces to it from uh, different races. And, you know, it, it's not like it's, it's not like the, the chassis is still relatively old. It's got a lot of components on it that just don't work. There's a lot of philosophies that are, that are inherent with this car that they really struggle with and they can't work them out. They just, they can't, they just need a brand new uh, race car. And to see them show up to the U S Grand Prix, slap this new floor onto the bottom of this car and have them be fast and competitive. That is a very positive sign for this team. Max wasn't just walking away with this one, like, you know, Mercedes, put up a good fight and McLaren put up a good fight as well. And it was, it, you know, it came down to the wire and, and, you know, like I'd said earlier, granted Verstappen was having, you know, breaking some breaking issues, but it wasn't something that was completely detrimental to his race. It wasn't like it was something that was failing on the car. Uh, it was essentially just a bit of a setup with it and he was just having trouble getting a good feel for the bricks. And I think like at the end of the day, when you see what, you know, Hamilton was able to do and the strategy that Mercedes ran in that first stint, you know, if Mercedes leaves Lewis out there a little less on that first stint, you know, we could be talking about a Hamilton, win and <laughs> disqualification. But at the end of the day, you bring him in two, three laps earlier. And I think this is a different story. I think on that first stint, I, I think this is a different race. You know, even Max had said like he'd lost Lewis had lost a lot of time with that. And it was a bit of a Mercedes mistake. And it was strategic wise. Um, but Hamilton drove a hell of a race. So he just drove well. I mean, obviously, and this is a track that he's done well at. So he does have success here. But coming into this weekend, like Mercedes wasn't, they, they were like, we're coming in here and being competitive. They, they didn't have that mindset. It was just, let's see what happens because they weren't sure what this upgrade was going to do. If it was going to produce what they wanted it to produce, they had no idea. I think that what they've learned over the past six months and jamming that into that floor and working around this sort of, you know, Frankenstein type car, they've really learned something here. And I think it's, it's going to unlock a ton of potential for them uh, for next season. Like this is a positive, this is a positive, granted the disqualification, you know, that's not great, but, it's a positive sign for Mercedes that they're going in the right direction. And I think that's, if you're a Mercedes fan, like that, that's gotta be music to your ears. If you're a formula one fan who wants to see some action and see, 
you know, Hamilton and Verstappen go at it again. I mean, you know, this is, this is pointing in that direction, which is awesome because <laughs> I'm here for it. Um, but yeah, it looks like things are headed in the right direction for Mercedes for sure. I mean, Mexico is going to be an interesting one. Uh, granted, you know, we're going to higher altitude there. So things are going to change a little bit. Um, but then you go to Brazil again, you know, that's, that's something where the Mercedes did well at last year and they were able to evolve that car and be competitive more towards the end of the season last year with that car. And now this one, you know, again, they're starting to get, they were competitive actually, you know, I would say after Monaco and they put those upgrades on, they started to understand it and eventually started to get more competitive. Um, now they're really competitive. And so, see what happens in Brazil, see what happens in Vegas and see what happens in Abu Dhabi. I mean, I think Mexico might be a bit of an outlier. I don't know how the, you know, the altitude may affect them a bit, but you know, we'll see how that plays out. I mean, it's exciting. I think this is, even though, you know, Verstappen's won this championship and Red Bull racing has won the constructors. There's still stuff that is on the line here. There's still stuff that, you know, interesting stories that are going to help us set up uh, what could be, uh, an excellent 2024. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot, a lot of folks behind the scenes and, um, you know, in the media who, who think that, you know, it may not be an exciting season next year. And granted it, it might not, but I'm not one of those. And I've been on this podcast saying this many, many times that with this regulation, the changes that we have seen, Anything is possible next season. It just is. I mean, obviously, real Red Bull will probably start with a bit of an advantage. But I think by the time you get to race five, six, seven, eight, there's teams that are going to have clawed that back and made this a fight. And that is something that I've talked with uh, to team personnel up and down the paddock all weekend long. And they all said the same thing that I was thinking and that I just told you. So take from that what you will we have zach brown on the podcast today and we did our interview uh with zach brown on on thursday I have to thank mclaren for setting all of that up for me it, it was great uh, of them to give me 15 minutes with with zach um you know i walked into this interview and uh and I got mic'd up by Netflix. Netflix walks up to me and they're like, Hey, you, are you cool if we like, you know, fill, shoot this and, and mic me up? And I'm like, uh, Yeah, go for it. I mean, let's see what happens here. Right. And so they mic'd me up. They mic Zach up. And uh, we did the podcast. I, now, whether or not that's going to be in the Netflix series, I have no idea. Uh, it, it may not. It may get left on the cutting room floor. I have no idea, but it, it'd be cool if it does. Right. It'd be pretty cool. It'd be pretty cool. Uh, but yeah. Anyways, here's our interview with McLaren CEO, Zach Brown. Joined by Zach Brown. Zach, thanks again for doing this. This is great. Um, so first off, you look amazing. Like, I've, you look like you've lost a lot of weight. I've lost a lot of weight. Yeah. yeah. Trying looking, to fit in my race cars a little bit better. Yeah, but you, well, you're looking fantastic. Yeah, no, it's a feel, feeling good. Tell oh, me your secret. <laughs> diet. Diet, diet, diet. Because yeah. I still don't like... Uh, working out too much but uh watching what i'm eating yeah. and and when i'm when i'm eating you know i live on planes yeah so uh having some red wine and some food on planes maybe when you can't move around right. is not uh best for the uh diet routine so just watching w what i'm doing health food wise and, and how, uh, that's like, making a big difference how challenging is that with the travel and like trying to it's hard. watch everything it's, yeah. it's very hard so it's all about uh, discipline yeah. which some things I'm very disciplined about, uh, others not. Yeah. Um, and so that was, you, you know, instead of having some delicious sausage and bacon for breakfast, <laughs> it's uh, granola and yogurt. But um, it's, made a, it's made a big difference. I feel much better. Uh, McLaren's Resurgence, we were on a media call with you back in, I want to say it was around the car launch. And it was you and Andrea and... You know, you're explaining how the start of the season was going to be a little bit, you know, more difficult. Sucked, I think is the technical term I've been using. Yes. <laughs> Did you expect, you know, this amount of performance to be clawed back within no. the season? No. Um, I, I was hopeful we'd get kind of back in the mix. I didn't think we would uh, make the jump we did to be, you know... Uh, I would say on a regular basis because it's not been on a regular basis, but you know, in, in, in kind of front of everybody else, being the second quickest team, uh, most races the second half of the year, 
Um, you know, our target coming into the year was to, to be fourth. I think we got a, a shot at that. At the beginning of the year, we were the ninth quickest team, so fourth seemed unachievable at that point. And, you know, here we are, 79 points behind out of third, which I think is a pretty tall order, but we're in the game, and uh, we're certainly going to give it all we, we have. And it's the biggest turnaround I've seen in Formula One that I can remember, and that's just all credit to the men and women at McLaren who have uh, kept their head down, worked hard. Uh, Andrea Stella has done a fantastic job leading this team. And, uh, you know, we've got to keep we got to keep pushing because we see how quickly things change in the sport. How much has the, the wind tunnel helped? Because you, know, you guys were using the one out in Cologne for yeah, so no, long uh, and now you've the, got the new the, one. The good news is nothing um, because we just moved into it. So, you know, the, the Toyota wind tunnel, they've been an awesome yeah. partner, very flexible. Um, you know, now our new wind tunnel has the latest, greatest uh, technology because Ultimately, it's the team's responsibility to invest, and, and so we chose to invest in our own uh, wind tunnel. Um, and then there's logistics, you know, going to another country uh, when you have a model shop that's, a, you know, 100 yards down, uh, down the corridor. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't even just the wind tunnel itself. It was the logistics and the operations are around it. So uh, the turnaround is by the same men and women that gave us the car at the start of the year. Uh, with the same technology and so i think that's what's been so impressive is what has changed is the leadership the empowerment the approach the structure and um so it's the it's the same people that have um, gave us a car in bahrain that gave us the same car in austria and silverstone and hats off to them uh, for for working so hard and andrea providing great leadership so we've got some fan questions so i'm going to mix those in along yep, with, go for with how we how we go um yeah, i've never really seen a like you know, I've been in racing since I was nine years old, and I've never seen a, a team claw back this much performance within a season. And it makes me wonder, you know, what what is possible for all of the teams during the off season? And this is a question from Elliot Norton, thirty five. Can or will anyone compete with Red Bull for next year? Oh yeah. Uh, now, whether anyone will, will uh, we'll find <laughs> out. But can sure. Um, you know they're 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 human. They've just done a awesome awesome job. Yeah. Uh, you know we're closing the the gap. Um, you know Max is driving unbelievable. Uh, it's an unbelievable team. But yeah, I th I think they're definitely beatable. We just need to do a better job, and that's what we're uh, we're trying hard to do. So for this regulation, when it started in 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 2022, I mean it's been fascinating to watch like the teams like I had mentioned like make these huge jumps in performance. And it makes me wonder when we get to 2026, should there be another like aero regulation or should they kind of freeze that part and just focus on the power unit side? Well, um, you know, Formula One's always been about innovation. Yeah. So, you know, I think from a pure on track point of view, if the longer the regulations stay the same, the more competitive yeah. the sport gets. So you could make an argument for uh, that. Uh, but then, you know, Formula One's DNA has all always been about technology, innovation, uh, progressing forward. So I think we need to stay consistent with our brand. So on the basis of that, I think they have regulations that are kind of in five-year chunks with some small modifications along the way is probably the best compromise. Because if you take a look at everyone but Max, look how competitive the sport is right now, yeah. right? We were ninth quickest team. Now we're second third you had Aston who was second quickest or kind of the fifth quickest now and and you know if you look at you know Sergio and Lewis if that was the fight for the championship yep. this would be one hell of a, a championship fight so uh, it's this Max guy who seems to be a little <laughs> bit special who's disrupting it all for us and but even you know the team in 10th uh, uh, Alpha Torre they're they're a threat to be in yep. Q3 every weekend so even the 10th place team if you'd like is a competitive yeah. racing team so uh a, a big change is also exciting because it brings a, a freshness and i think there's a lot of people that follow the sport for a variety of different reasons but one of the big reasons is they want to see these new cars and the developments yeah. all the time so i have to be careful i think we have to be careful to freeze things for too long gotcha and that uh, brings us to a question from parlad94 uh, he'd like to know, joining McLaren at the tail, tail end of 2016, what was something you had identified as a major challenge facing the team that an outside observer or fan wouldn't have known about? And how did the team address this over time? Uh, well, there were a lot of problems when I started. We uh, 
I joined it uh, the worst year the team had ever had. Um, what was visible from the outside is the lack of sponsorship and partnership and therefore resources, but uh, that was visible. So I wouldn't say that's directly answering that question because you could look at the car and go, they don't really have many sponsors and therefore, you know, how can you invest? Uh, so that was one big problem. Uh, that problem is pretty much solved oh, yeah. uh, now in, 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 a, in a big way with some of the best companies uh, in the world uh, on, on, on our team shirt and on the race car. Um, but I think what was harder for people to see was morale was really down. Um, you know, here's a team who's won 20 world championships, second most successful team in the history of the sport, finishing ninth in the championship. That was demoralizing. And when people get demoralized, they act in different ways. You get into conspiracy theories and yep. lack of trust and loss of motivation. And so uh, that was the hardest part was trying to get uh, a thousand plus people. Uh, and and it's not, not everyone had lost their motivation and, and, and morale, but uh, enough to not be a, a cohesive uh, sports team. And so that's what was the hardest, uh, probably the part that uh, surprised me the most. I was able to identify, you know, it was a leadership issue. Mm -hmm. um, people people need leadership, and you know, the decline really started. If you can kind of look back to when the decline started, it was probably in uh, 2013. Um, that's when Lewis left. Yeah, so Lewis kind of saw it coming. Right, we were competitive yeah. in in 12. Then Martin Whitmarsh takes over and then it became a bit of a revolving door um from that point forward you had uh, four or five different team bosses and i think in any business uh if your leadership's changing every other year uh you that's that's not going to provide great leadership for uh, the team who's looking for uh, a set of leaders not just one person to lead the charge so that's what i tried to do was just bring some stability and some momentum and some resources and uh, now we've got a, a great leadership team and um, we're uh, got a lot of energy i can see that for sure but you can tell by on the track what's happening um the uh, podcast network that our podcast is on has a very massive uh nhl fan base and uh from blash drill would like to know zach who is your favorite nhl team huh. uh that's a cool question because one of my favorite players is uh, a guest of mine this weekend, T. Mussolini. Oh, no. Uh, okay, uh, okay. He's, he's getting in this <laughs> afternoon, but he didn't play for my favorite team. Same city. Uh, my favorite Anaheim teams. Ducks, uh, right? Well, he played for the Ducks. Yeah. Uh, my favorite team is the LA Kings, being from, okay. from LA. Uh, Andre Kopitar, uh, who's the captain, is a, uh, a, a great buddy. Uh, so it's fun having the. Uh, the got, my two sports are hockey and baseball, so uh, Cardinals are my baseball team. So I got Paul Goldschmidt out this weekend awesome. it was the uh, MVP yeah. in 22 yeah. and uh, golf is the other so we've got some fun golfers out here this weekend so it's one of the uh, fun parts of this sport is uh, the other athletes from the other sports uh, enjoy it so we get to share uh, share uh, passions I want to talk a bit about Oscar I know we don't have a lot of time left but um, you know you went through a lot to get to get Oscar and uh, one of the questions that we had from Matthew Jansen 8 asks, you know, what is the one thing that has impressed you the most about Oscar Piastri and his rookie season? His, um, it's more than one. Yeah. It's his maturity. It's his technical understanding. Uh, we knew the speed was there. Uh, and you should see his data through the fast stuff. He's, uh, he's not scared. Um, but his maturity and technical understanding about how to approach a weekend. So, you know, he builds up to it. You see a lot of rookies who try and kind of get too fast too quickly, and then they end up in the in the fence, and they, they kind of ruin their weekend. So he's got a real maturity, a, a real calmness. He builds up. He doesn't kind of worry about Friday lap times. He's a great student. I think Lando's a great teammate. I think Lando's, you know, arguably the fastest guy in Formula One, E, Max, Lewis. And um, Oscar's just done an outstanding job. It was interesting to watch his uh, progression from Japan, like the race in Japan and dealing with the tire deg and trying to understand that and then taking that and moving it on to Qatar. You could see the, j yeah, just, from, just from the racing. Yeah, like. I think if you look at, um, you know, the being a rookie areas to Im improve, which yeah. is to be expected, is, is tire management, race management. But he, he, you know, don't forget he didn't even race last year. Yeah. So 
Uh, the pace is very clear. And, yeah, Qatar, he, he managed that race perfectly. Japan, so um, that's been an area that just comes with experience, yeah. and, and he's, uh, he's a quick learner. Uh, you drove the, uh, the MCL 35M recently in Barcelona, I believe. I did. That was okay. fun. Okay. Well, you got to tell me, what was that like? That was, uh, it's undescribable. You know, people ask me, well, yeah. what's, it, what's it like? And it's kind of like trying to describe... You know, what's it like to have Mike Tyson hit you? <laughs> uh, and until he's hit you, you know, um, it, it just, the power is insane. The, the braking is insane. The cornering forces are insane. Uh, I'm very jealous of Lando and Oscar's uh, day job. Yeah, for sure. Were you flat through uh, turn three? The long I was uh, not right flat through two. I was better through turn three than I was through uh, nine. Yeah. Because um, three, you can kind of feel your way uh, around. I eventually got. Uh, flat, uh, not flat soon enough. Um, but what the car is just amazing. You could tell it'll do it. You just need to be uh, brave enough to do it. And I did three, four lap runs, so uh, I kept my bravery in check. The turn, uh, I guess, the turn eight, that really tight, like left hander is kind of like fun. threading the eye of a yeah, needle. Well, that, yeah, is that, that? that's fun because you can kind of chuck the car around through there a little really? bit. Really? Okay. Because yeah, it's got some elevation and camber changes okay. and change of direction. So I actually found that corner to be. Uh, a lot of fun because you could kind of play around there a little bit. I uh, only have a few minutes left, but I want to get the two more questions in from at P56 Front Ask. When will we see a North American McLaren Palooza? So I believe you're doing something similar with, uh, is it the Velocity Invitational? Yes. In November in Sonoma? Yep. Sonoma? Yep. We're going to bring out, uh, oh God, it's got to be 10, 10 of our more iconic cars and most of our racing drivers and celebrating our 60th year. Uh, you know, the America is a hugely important market for us, especially the, the Bay Area. We have a lot of partners there. We've got a tremendous amount of fans. And I think when I look back uh, to Formula One and racing and what I liked as a fan, because I still consider myself very much to be a fan, it was getting close to the drivers, seeing the cars. Yeah. and. You know they're no good sitting in a uh, <laughs> sitting in a closet somewhere. We need to get them out there and share them with our fans. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Can you run us through a bit of the lineup of, of what yeah, you got? We have everything from Emos, our first world championship yep. car, to James Hunt, to uh, Lewis Hamilton's car, to some Senna, some Prost, Lauda. You, you kind of name one of our world champions, and they, oh, it's going to be um, it's going to be the crown jewels that we bring out. MP44. Uh, I think we have an MP4 no five, way. Four, okay, four, four, five, but we definitely have a Senna car out there. Because I think, was Pato in the MP44 at one he point? He drove 4.5. Four, 4.5, five. Four, five. He okay. drove 4.5. Because he posted some of that on his Instagram. And <laughs> yeah, oh, he was man. he was flying. He, he was not being <laughs> shy. No. I told him how his car was worth, but he didn't seem to uh, <laughs> pay attention. But he kept it on uh, kept it on the island. His hands are fast. So <laughs> For he, sure. Uh, he, he loved it. Um, last question. I actually want to talk about Pato real quick and uh, the super license. Like, what does he have to do to kind of attain that? If he does like uh, would he, you he he's qualified so we've he uh, we've submitted he's he's got the points okay, so, i uh, thought he had to finish like third in the indycar well standings you had during the COVID era some special rules oh, so okay. uh we, we've had it confirmed that uh he's eligible so we've applied oh, awesome. so uh that's great that's great yeah, yeah. It, would you consider him as like a reserve driver yeah, for sure for like sure. at the end of an indycar for, for, season yeah yeah for sure yeah. Awesome. You'll, you'll see pato in our formula cool. formula one car more often and uh certainly next year when his indycar season's done you'll see him uh, hanging out in our garage more zach thanks very much for taking the time i appreciate it my pleasure again big thanks to mclaren for setting all that up for us much appreciated uh we have another special guest and uh, like i said on the discord on Thursday night, if you were on the Discord, uh, SDPN Discord, check it out. Head on over to the SDPN D Discord. Um, follow along. It's great. Great community. Uh, great group of people on there, too. It's, re it's really awesome. I had a lot of fun. Uh, Justin Fisher was our uh, host. Uh, Robert did a, an amazing job at just setting the entire thing up. So big shout out to Robert uh, for taking care of all that as well it was a ton of fun uh, but anyways on the uh the discord um i had mentioned that uh we're going to be getting a special guest on thursday coming up uh we i, I don't want to tell you who it is just yet but uh i may we may put out a call for uh for fan questions i'm just trying to confirm um with the uh with the team uh to make sure that they're cool with with fan questions and, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, granted some, some teams are, some teams aren't, that's just the way it is. Um, but yeah, you, you're all going to be, uh, 
pretty pretty excited for this one, I think. Well, I hope you are. I know I am. It's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, anyways, thanks very much, everyone, for uh, watching and listening. Really appreciate it. I'll be back later this week. Uh, I'll try and uh, take a deeper dive into the U.S. Grand Prix, give you a little more backstory on uh, some of these other teams and drivers um, that I could spend some time with and, and learn a few things. Uh, please head on over to Spotify. Give us a five-star rating and a follow same goes with apple podcast write a review please it helps us a lot and you can watch us on uh youtube as well you can follow me on social media at tim haraney and we'll be back in a few days time and i'll talk to you all then <laughs>